All right, good morning, church. Happy Palm Sunday. Can you believe it's almost Easter? Easter will be here next week. Uh, what a gorgeous week it's been. Well, actually, I take that back. What a crazy week it's been. Uh, we've had some beautiful days, some warm weather. It was our last week coaching football for the middle school. And then, what was it, Wednesday? It snowed there. It was crazy. Well, hopefully you're getting some projects done and, and just pray a, a blessing for you today. I do have a few quick announcements I want to go over. Um, <clears throat> number one, um, we will be sending out new reading plans in, in the mail um, to those of you guys that are not at church next Sunday. And so look for that. It's part of what we're just encouraging people to go through. Uh, next Sunday is Easter. Praise the Lord. We're so excited. Christ is risen. We're excited about what God is doing. I want to thank each and every one that was here last Sunday. We had a just a wonderful time and three baptisms, and hopefully you're able to see those online. We do apologize for Pastor Gary uh, not getting to hear his message. It actually, the batteries died on the, on the camera halfway through, so uh, very frustrating. But we were able to get um, them presenting me with my credentials, which was a little more emotional than I expected. I'm not used to people saying so many nice things. I like to, to brag on others. It was a, it's a little humbling up there, but thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. It really did mean a lot. So a uh, great report from Pastor Gary and Pastor Chris being here. So thank you so much. Next Sunday for Easter, we're going to have a fairly typical uh, normal service, but uh, we are going to be doing a continental breakfast from nine, about that nine to ten o'clock hour, and so if you want to come early and bring some, <coughs> excuse me, some friends and family to come be a part and enjoy some breakfast, I I hear that uh, Sharon is making some breakfast burritos as well on top of muffins and fruit, and so I uh, should have a wonderful spread here. So uh, we would love to see you all next Sunday if that's something you're able to come to. <coughs> With that being said, um, the Friday night, Good Friday, what we've decided to do, we are doing our memory verse. So hopefully, um, and if you're staying home, working on the memory verse as well, hopefully you're getting pretty close to that. I'm, I'm almost there. I'm really trying hard to get this memorized uh, because I know there's a big taco feed for those that do get it memorized on this Friday as well. Starting at 5.30 to 6.30, we're going to eat tacos. And then from 7 to 8, uh, the worship team's going to be here. We're just going to do a night of just worship and prayer and just uh, just worshiping the Lord on Friday night. So it should be a, a wonderful, wonderful evening. So uh, plan on being that. That's this Friday the 2nd uh, here at the church. And finally, something else that you might just want to kind of put on the calendar. It's a Saturday, uh, April 17th. <clears throat> We've asked some of the men to be a part, but uh, it's not exclusively to men. But we want to take and go up to our Open Bible Camp, which is up on Waits Lake, kind of just off of Waits Lake, and help them out a little bit and do uh, work up there for a few hours and help them with the cleanup. So uh, that's on the 17th if you want to get out and do some raking and whatever else they kind of need for us up there. And I'll be giving more information, but just save the date that morning. We're going to have men's that morning and then probably just bus up there for, for the rest of that morning and, and spend some time uh, to help them take care of our campground. <clears throat> All right, with that being said, let's, uh, let's pray for our kids, let's pray for our offering, let's get right into the Word this morning. Father, we praise you, we thank you for who you are, God, you're a mighty God. Lord, we thank you for our kids, Lord, we thank you for watching over them, Lord, for keeping them safe, Father, for what you're doing in our area, Lord, we pray a, just a hedge of protection on Riverside, Lord, and um, from, the, from the kindergarten and, and the preschool, Lord, all the way up through our high school, Lord, and to our teachers, and and we just pray your hand of protections upon them, Lord. We pray that you bring unity in our community, Father. We thank you for what you're doing. Lord, we also pray a blessing on, on the offering, Lord. And, and Lord, what you've blessed us with, Lord. And I pray that you just bless those that can give, Father, and those that can't. I just pray that you just bless them this week so they have something to offer you next week. Lord, we thank you for all this, Lord. Be with us now as we get in your word. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. You know, as I started praying for the kids, I thought real quickly... Friday night, we played football, and Riverside played Deer Park, and this is the first time we have beat them in, I think they said, over eight years. And so, uh, I'm very excited. Uh, I have to bring on my son. He got a chance. He played quarterback and played pretty good that night, and uh, but really worked hard. The kids really played hard, but they won 7-3. to three. Uh, Just crazy defensive battle, but typical Riverside-Deer Park game. But finally, we came out on top. So, uh, <laughs> yay, Riverside. All right, let's get started. Romans 8, 28 through 34. 
Get your Bibles out. <clears throat> We're going to be breaking down the second half of this passage this morning, so you're going to want a notebook um, and a few different things. <clears throat> and so here we go. Romans 8, 28, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. <clears throat> For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? That's the part I know pretty good. Here's the next part we're going to focus on today. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. That's our memory verse. I hope you're getting memorized. Tacos are going to be amazing. But let's look at verse 31 here. And let me get my Bible out because I like to... I just like reading it out of the Bible better than off a piece of paper for some reason. And so let's turn to Romans here. Romans 8. There we go. What then, in verse 31 it says, What then shall we say to these things if God is for us, who is against us? And that's the title of my message today. If God is for us, who is against us? Uh, other translations say, who can be against us? See, as believers, this is an essential statement for our faith and for our belief. And, and to understand truly that if God is the one going before, who really can stand against us? It's not man. Uh, it's, it's not uh, guidelines, it's not rules, it's not the enemy. The enemy has no power of us. If God is before us, who can be against us? And the answer is no one. Nothing. <clears throat> um, look at this. Uh, turn with me to Psalm 118. Don't lose, don't lose Romans here, but look at, what, look at what King David says in Psalm 118, uh, verse 6. Here we go. 118. Smaller chapter, right before, sandwiched right between the smallest chapter of 117, which is two verses, and the longest chapter, it feels like, is Psalm 119. So here we go. Psalm 118, 6 says this, The Lord is for me, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now think about that promise. Do you believe that promise, that if God is for you, we have nothing to fear? If God is on our side, why should we be afraid? If God is before us, what man can stand against us? And the answer is no man. What can man do to you? And the answer, well, you could say he could, he could make me stay home or he could make me uh, not go to work or he could persecute me or, or maybe he could even take my life. And that could be the worst. But to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. And, he's, and here's King David who was constantly, it seems like, being chased by people trying to kill him. And he just says, well, listen, the Lord is for me. If God is for me, I, I have nothing to be afraid of. And what can man really do to me if God is on my side? God already knows what he wants me to do. See, the better we understand who God is, the more it will change our thinking, really, of how we're going to serve him. The more that you begin to understand that really, is God your protector? Is God your father? Is God the one that's going before? And when you begin to understand that the heart the, of, of God, it changes how you want to serve him. Look what John says here in uh, John 14, um, verse 15. He goes and he puts his command. He goes, uh, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, this is a verse we, we, we talk about, we think about, and this is just kind of after he's kind of explained a lot of things to his disciples. And, and, and he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, when you read that, I want you to think, is this a command? If you love me, you will keep my commands. Or is this a desire of the heart that, well, if you, if you love me, you will keep my commandments? 
<laughs> if it's something that you strive to do, that you love, that you when you begin to understand who God is, then it's like we're compelled, we, we desire now to follow his commands. It's something, it changes our understanding of who he is. We really have to keep seeking the Lord. We really, that's why it's so essential. That's why it's so important to keep studying this word, to stay in this word, to get this understanding and revelation of, of, of who God is and, and, and how we're designed to follow and trust Him. Because when we believe that He's our protector, when we believe that He's our provider, in these times when things don't seem to make sense and, and we're not sure what to do next, we understand, well, listen, if God is for us, I have nothing to be afraid of. If God is the one leading me, I have nothing to worry about. What can man really do to me if God is on my side? I love that. I love that. Um, I do want to add, I talked about MySword, which is a great app for your phone. Sometimes it's not on the Play Store, but if you go, and I'm going to put the link in the description below, but it's MySword.info. You can take to the website. Just browse it uh, through your browser on your phone, and it'll have a download page, and you'll have to accept uh, outside because it's, it's, it's downloading stuff outside of the Play Store, but then that'll put it on your phone. And I've had a few people say they were able to get it downloaded, uh, but that is the same uh, excellent resource and tool to study in the Word of God. It breaks down the original Greek and Hebrew words for you just at the push of a button. And so, uh, uh, so check that out, mysword.info, uh, and you should be able to find that download. All right, here we go. First thing I want to look at, let's go to uh, ch verse Romans chapter 8, verse 32. Let's look at the first part of the second part of the passage here. And it says this, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? <coughs> The coffee's gone. I've, I've been here a little bit uh, this morning already, putting together a PowerPoint at the church here. And uh, and we have the blood bank going on. So for those of you who came and gave blood, uh, thank you. And I uh, should have swung in and said hi to me. <laughs> um, here we go. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Let's look at that first part. He who did not spare his own son. Now, this is a this is an interesting phrase. And, and the first... Uh, word we want to look at here is spare. He who did not spare his own son. Now this is talking about God. And I want us as we kind of break, as we study through this and we go through here to try to remember, we're trying to understand the heart of God. We really want to see, okay, what does it mean? God says that he who did not spare his own son, God did not get rid of his own son. That word spare, it's this word verb, and it really means to spare or abstain or kind of, um, I could add to withhold or to keep for myself. So, you know, maybe I think of uh, my coffee cup, right? This is my coffee. I don't want to share. It's mine. It's personal. I think of uh, um, things that, that I think are of value and important. He says, he who did not spare his own son, God did not spare that which was most precious to him. You know, I think about, I want you to think about your own son or your own daughter or or you know something that you you really cherish and value, or maybe may, maybe your kids are gone. Maybe it's your cat or your dog or or your chickens. <laughs> uh, and you think about these things that you you've poured time and you love, you care about, you cherish, you value. And it says, w the question is, would you be willing to give them away? I mean, I lo I love 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 my children. I adore them. I now have a, a, a little tiny dog that runs around my house and she can drive me nuts sometimes, but I still would never want to give her to the wrong person. Uh, we have friends that, well, Brian and Tara, you know, they're raising, uh, they, they, they had these puppies and, and as you know, they know that before they go and give them away, they want to make sure the new owners are responsible, good owners, so their, their puppies are, have a chance to be, to be raised in, in a good home. And here's what it's saying about the heart of God. It says, he who did not spare his own son. He was willing to give up that which was most precious to him. You know, I'm reminded by a few examples in the Old Testament. And the first one that, uh, that came to my mind was, was the story of Abraham and how God asked him to, to give up, to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. And what that meant, and, and, and Abraham just having to trust and believe that God was going to take care of it. But 
I think there's even another story that 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 was was harder for me to read and and really relate to, and this is found in First Samuel. So turn with me to First Samuel. We're going to read this whole first chapter. So there's a lot of reading. I'm going to try to not choke my way through it here. But the difference between these two stories, we have Abraham, who's a father, and he finally has a son, and it's very precious to him. But there's something different to know between the bond between a father and son and the bond between a mother and her child and a mother and her only child. <clears throat> so here we go. Let's, let's start in verse 1, and I'm just going to kind of read through it pretty quickly, and then we'll, we'll discuss as we go. It says, Now there was a certain man from uh, Ramathame Zophon, from the hill country of Ephraim, and his wife, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, the son uh, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. Now we've we've read we've heard this story before <coughs> about a man with two wives, and one has children and the other doesn't for some reason. Well, this is no different. It says he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Peniah. Peniah. Penin. Peninah. Peninah. And Peninah had children, and Hannah had no children. Where have we heard this story before? Remember Leah and Rachel? It says, Now this man would go up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord the ho of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli... Uh, Hoff, Hophni and Phinehas were priests to the Lord there. When the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters. So Peninnah had all these children. Once again, children were a blessing. Children were, were a sign of life, of, of, of blessing from the Lord. And so to have children, to have many children, it was just kind of this representation that God was blessing you. And he would go in and we give all this, this stuff so they could go up and worship. And he says, but to Hannah in verse 5, he would give a double portion for he loved Hannah, Hannah but the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. We've seen this same scenario multiple times. <clears throat> one is having children. God is blessing the one. Um, but we see because the father doesn't love that one, they get a blessing uh, uh, from the Lord, but they provoke the other one, the one that, that their womb is closed, and they have to wait. But for whatever reason, we see kind of the, the husband of all these scenarios. They seem to love the one that can't be producing children, just like Jacob, right, and, and, and Rachel and Leah. And we, we see this just constantly happening. And, and here's something, verse 7, says, It happened year after year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she would provoke her. So she wept and would not eat. I think of how difficult it must have been for Hannah at this time. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep and why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? <clears throat> then Hannah rose after eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting at the seat by the doorposts of the temple of the Lord. Verse 10, she, great, she, greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant, and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give me your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and a razor shall never come on his head. Now it came about as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli was watching her mouth. As for Hannah, she was speaking in her heart, only her lips were moving, but, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought she was drunk. Verse 14, Then Eli said to her, How long will you make yourself drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah replied, No, my Lord, I am a woman oppressed in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant as a worthless woman, for I have spoken until now out of my great concern and prov uh, provocation. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant your petition that you uh, have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. And look at this. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. 
She came and she said, Lord, God, if you give me a son, if you hear from me, if you answer my prayer, I will give you that which is most precious. If you were to bless me with a son and take away the shame, really, of not being able to bear children, and, and I would give you everything. And it says her whole countenance changed. Instead of being sad and weeping, she went away. She, she was, her, it says her face was no longer sad. Then they arose early in the morning, worshipped before the Lord, and returned again to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah had relations with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And it came about in due, uh, in due time after Hannah had conceived that she gave birth to a son. And she named him Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. Then the man Elkanah went up with all his household to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up. For she said to her husband, I will not go up until the child is weaned. Then I will bring him up that he may be appear before the Lord and stay there forever. Elkanah, Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Remain until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord confirm his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she was weaned. Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with a three-year-old bull and one ephah of flour and a jug of wine and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. Although the child was young, then they slaughtered the bull and brought the boy to Eli. She said, O my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. For this boy I prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition, which I asked of him. So I have also dedicated him to the Lord as long as he lives. He is dedicated to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord uh, there. <clears throat> you know, I look at this passage. Hannah, who, 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 who longed and desired so much to have a son, but she made this vow with God that if he would give her, she would, she would give him back to him. And we could argue that, you know what, she could have argued, you know, Lord, can I just keep him a little bit longer? Lord, do I really, can't he worship down here? But she knew how important it was to turn that back over. And this is understanding the heart of, so Hannah's heart is that, you know what, listen, I love my son, but I love my God. And I'm trusting that God's going to do something amazing with this blessing that I've turned back over to him. And here's what the word says. It says, he who did not spare his own son, Christ, God did not keep his own son. He could have, he could have made up excuses and say, you know, I, I don't want to send Jesus down there. We'll find a different way. I'm not sending my only son down to that place. Look at what it says. She did not spare her son and neither did God. She kept her word. The next part of that phrase back in Romans, it says, He who did not spare his own son, he says, but delivered him over for us all. Let's look at that word delivered. That word delivered is a verb, and it means to give into the hands of, to keep, use, manage. Another uh, uh, translation says, to deliver up to custody, to permit, allow. Uh, when fruit will allow, that, that is when its ripeness permits. I'm going to come back to that phrase in a second and say it again. But I think of this word in a few, word, uh, a few different ways, delivered. You know, it means I can, I can hand things over. Um, like if I was to take and just give something to you. So uh, imagine I, I took the keys to my car and I said, here, you can, you can have my car. Uh, it, it's yours. And I give you the keys. And, and you, you, maybe you go and take care of it and you make it all nice. Or maybe you just kind of throw everyone in the back, you know, the dog, the cat, the chickens, who knows. You know, you got garbage on the floor. You off-road it up the hill. It doesn't matter. I've taken, I said, listen, this is yours. So this word delivered, it means it's no longer mine. I'm giving it to you. You know, I think of the other word it says in there, deliver up to custody. And uh, I grew up in a, a, a blended family, meaning I had uh, a stepdad and a step siblings and uh, stepbrothers and sisters. And, <coughs> and if you've ever been through some of those uh, battles, you can have this custody battle of who gets the children. And whether it's the mother or the father. And, and, and what he's saying, he says, you know what? It's like giving up your rights to that child. It's like saying, you know what? Fine, you take, you have custody of the children. You, you can raise them however you want, good or bad. They're yours. And this is what's saying about God. He says, he didn't spare his own son. He says, but he delivered him over really to this world for all of us. For all of us. Once you release control, the new owner now can do whatever they want. 
Now here's an interesting one I want us to look at. The other example used in this translation says the word permit allow. And I was like, okay, permit allow. And it says this, when the fruit will allow, that is when its ripeness permits. So it's like the fruit. And, and I begin to think about the fruit that we buy from the store. And a lot of times the fruit we get from the store seems to be not ripe. Uh, you know, think of bananas or, or apples sometimes. And you open a banana, it's like rock hard. And you're like, eh, that's, not, that's not very good. And then you have to wait. And you sit on the counter and it waits and it waits. And, and it's like that moment that it, it's talking about when the fruit uh, allows it to be ripe. It's like it waits, it waits, and then says, now it's ripe. I think about avocados. Avocados have to be the worst, I think. And uh, you bring them home and they're rock hard and you're like, rock hard, rock hard. And then you got like 45 minutes before they go from rock hard to, to, to rotten, it feels like. And so, you know, find that perfect avocado seem, sometimes can be just uh, a challenge. But, but this concept that it's, it's holding on, it's holding on, it's holding on, and then it's allowing it to be ripe. It's, it's, it's releasing that ripeness. And I think this is what God did for us is he says, you know what? All right, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you Christ. I'm going to give you my son. But there's something still that's going to happen. And it's going to be released at a certain time. God still had a plan. It makes me just think that God delivered his son over to the world, but but he did that with a plan in mind. That God was that Jesus came and they thought they had all this plan. They thought they were doing it right and they thought that they they knew everything that was going on and then all of a sudden it ripens, the fruit ripens. Then all of a sudden Christ comes and, and he begins to, to share his, uh, his start as a ministry and he begins to perform miracles and people can see, begin to see that he's the son of God and, and he begins to present this new gospel and then, then he dies and he raises again and it changes everything. It changes everything. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us all. All this word is 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 very. It, it means uh, individually, everyone, all, everything, and so I want us to kind of keep this in mind because it says he delivered him over for us all. God gave him over for you, for me, for your neighbor, for all. God gave him over for all. <clears throat> now look at this next part of this verse. It says, "How will he not also with him?" Talking about Christ, with him freely give us all things. How will he? So he says, if God didn't withhold the thing that which was most precious to him and gave him to a fallen world uh, full of corruption, basically gave full cuss and said, all right, here you go. But I got this plan in mind. He says, if he's willing to give up that, how will he not give us with him freely give us all things? Look at that phrase, freely give. This word is a verb, to freely give. It means to do something pleasant, gracious, or kind. Like, hey, this is something nice I'm doing for you. It says to grant forgiveness or pardon. Now think about what he's doing with Christ. Freely give. He, through Christ, he's offering forgiveness of everything we've done. Through Christ, he wants to offer blessings to those around. Uh, he wants to graciously, another, another translation of that word freely give, means to forgive or graciously to restore one to another, <clears throat> to preserve for one a person in peril. We think about what can God do through Christ. I've titled this first, this first point here really is all things are possible. All things are possible. You know, we, can't, we, we kind of think that, you know, what can God do for me? Who is God really? And what he's saying is that, listen, I didn't, I didn't withhold that which was most precious. I gave it away, and I gave it away for a reason, and I gave it away for you. I gave away so you could be forgiven. I gave it away to restore, once again, this relationship between man and God. I gave it away to help a person that seems to be going through troubling times. This is the heart of God says he will not how will he not also with him freely give us all things all things that is the same f word that was used before that he gave it over for all so we can have all things the same thing it means it means everyone it means everything it means all it means all all things everyone all things are possible Matthew 7, 11 says this. It says, 
If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask Him? The first point I want to make is that really all things are possible. All things. We have to stop limiting what God can do. We have to stop thinking <coughs> that this is all that God is able to do. You know what? God can't provide for me because of this. You know, does God even watch what's happening right now? Absolutely. God didn't withhold his own son. He can give you all things. He wants to give us all things. He wants to bless his children. <coughs> he wants to give good gifts. We need to stop limiting what God can do. God did not spare his own son so that all things could be possible. Look at uh, John 3.16. I know it's one of our you know, most, probably the most famous reference whether everybody knows the whole passage or not. It's probably the most famous reference. But it says this in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is the same exact concept that's saying here is that God, He gave Him over. It was going to be fulfilled. Uh, he had this plan, and the plan was that none should perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to judge the world, which sometimes we think, when we think of God, He's just down here pointing fingers. He didn't. You have to do what I commanded you. If you love me, you will do what I command. He says He didn't send in to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. And it changed this mentality to say, listen, if you love me, listen. Let me help you. I want to forgive you. I want to take that burden. I want to take that away from you. If you love me, you will do what I can. You'll desire to please me. And this is changing our heart and our concept of who God is. And if, if you, as, as we begin to understand who God is, it changes how we want to serve Him. All things are possible. If God is for us, who can be against us? What can man do to me? All right, let's keep moving on. Let's keep moving on. Verse 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. That word, who will bring a charge? That's the first thing. And, and King James uses the translation, uh, lay anything to the charge of. And I like that term, to lay anything. It's almost like to present thing. That bring a charge is a verb. It means to come forward as an accuser against or to call in question. Like, you know, I wonder what's going on here. You know, sometimes, <laughs> I was just thinking of this, you know, when you watch sports and, uh, uh, as a coach, you know, you're always making all these, you know, you, you're thinking of a million different things. But as a fan, you kind of watch and you're like, what was the coach thinking? Do they even know what they're doing? Do this, is there a plan going on? And what it's saying is that that's what's called to bring a charge. It's almost like accusing, like, do you even know what you're doing? Do you have the right to do this? We're calling into question, um, it's a calling question towards uh, or throughout something. Who will be accusing and presenting and questioning God's elect? So look at this. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Who's going to be standing up saying, do you know what you're doing? And this is what the world tries to do to us. They want to question uh, the, the people that are Christians, the people that are telling people about Jesus. They will say, what makes you think that that's the right way? What makes you think what you believe is true? What makes you better than everybody else? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? That word elect, now this is interesting. Look at that word elect. It's an adjective. It's not a noun. It's an adjective. So it's not, it's not, it's not a group of people. It's describing a type of people. <clears throat> it describes something. Here's some definitions for that word elect. It means picked out. It means chosen. It means obtained salvation through Christ. The best of its kind or class. <clears throat> God's elect are the people that Christ has saved. The people that have said yes to Jesus. The people that said, listen, I want to follow God with my whole heart. And I'm going to do what he says. The elect are those that, that have obtained salvation through, its, through Christ. Which means that now, once you've said yes to Jesus, you've been selected. You've been chosen. It's not a predestined group. It's not a pre-selected group. It's saying once you've said yes to Jesus and you say, I want to follow him with everything, you now you now become, it's like saying the best of its kind or class. You have, you, you're adopted into the family of God. 
and it changes everything and says, who's going to bring a charge against those people? And a lot of people say, listen, you're not doing this. You're not doing that. Well, you know, what makes all these rights? And look at how this goes on next. It says, God is the one who justifies. Now, we talked about justified a few times. It's like justified, never done it. But justify really means to render righteous. To render righteous. To take something that's, that's bad, that's evil, that's dirty, and render it righteous. Render it clean. <clears throat> and who does that? It says, God is the one who justifies. Who has the right to argue or accuse God of what righteousness is? Now, think about this. Who says, well, well. Who, who determines what's righteous or not? I say, well, man, that's pretty good for me. <clears throat> and we have to remember this passage was written to the Romans. The Romans were, this was kind of pre before they were getting really persecuted as Christians. But what happened, you know, Paul was this missionary who went out and he kind of planted all these churches. And Rome was no exception. And you have kind of this body of believers that is kind of crossbred between what they used to know and believe and how they were worship and, and this new gospel that's being taught and you're starting to see the Holy Spirit move and, and they're still trying to figure out what they're supposed to do and what they're not ha what they don't have to do. And it's just like almost every other church in, in, in the early church model that they were still trying they were, they were caught up in, in the law, uh, works versus grace and Christ and all those things. <clears throat> and Paul was constantly teaching this understanding of God's grace. And so the second point, as I talk about today, that I find from this is that it's not by works. It's not by works. We can't do it. Uh, he had a similar conversation with the Ephesians. Turn with me to Ephesians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I learned that from uh, with the acronym General Electric Power Company, G-E-P-C. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. So here we go. Uh, Ephesians, that's a side note. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, and it says this, For by the grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and, not, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Uh, verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we would walk in them. God is the one who justifies. We cannot justify ourselves. Think about it. We don't determine whether we're righteous. Uh, we can't be good enough. It's only by the grace of God that we are justified. It's His gift to us. Sometimes we fear that, you know, if I'm just good enough, then, you know, then, then that, that ought to let me in. You know, if I determine that, I, well, I feel I follow the rules, so I must be righteous. God is the one who justifies. God is the one who determines whether we're righteous or not. Righteous or not. <clears throat> we cannot be good enough. I want you to say that we, there's, there's, it's impossible. I, I remember the example uh, shared, shared to me before. You know, you may be a great swimmer, and you may be an Olympic swimmer. But, you know, don't just think swimming across like a lake or something. Think of swimming to Hawaii or across the ocean. I mean, these are things that... It's almost impossible, right? We can't do it. It's only by the grace of God that we are justified. It's only by His free gift that you are rendered righteous. This is the God that we serve. If God is for us, <coughs> who or what can be against us? Now think about it. If God someone says you're righteous, what can anyone else do to you? All right, let's keep moving on. Last one, verse 34. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. So let's break this down. Who is the one who condemns? You know, let's look at that word condemn. It's a verb and it means to give judgment against, to judge worthy of punishment, to s sentence. So we think of, you know, it's condemn. Who is the one who condemns? Who is the one that does all the judging? But there's something else here that really sticks out. Another translation of that word says this, by one's good example, to render another's wickedness the more evident. Okay, I'm going to say that one more time. Uh, by one's good example, to render another's wickedness the more evident. Who is the one who condemns? Who is the one that lives such a holy life that everyone else and everything else in comparison looks wicked? Not, not that Christ came to just point out all the bad things everyone else was doing. 
Christ came to live uh, an example and model a life that we realize that, listen, in comparison, we can't live up to that same standard. Compared to Christ, we look wicked. I think about like, I begin to think of different examples and, and my wife, she's an amazing, amazing artist. Uh, she, she decorates cakes right now. She has a fantastic color palette, uh, very skilled in, in sculpting and painting. Um, I don't paint real well. I know they say they, they tease me because they say I'm colorblind. I'm only colorblind in a few shades. I'm not complete. I can tell different colors, but I get harassed all the time about being colorblind. But the the point is is that you know if you asked uh, my wife to paint a portrait of something, and then you asked me to paint a portrait of something, <laughs> in comparison, it would look like uh, a, a, an actual artist against like a kindergartner. That's, that's where my skill lies. It shows the difference of someone who, who is, is skilled and highly skilled in a certain area and someone else who, who just in comparison, it doesn't matter how hard they try, they're just not as talented. Do you know someone so good at their craft that everyone else looks like an amateur? I mean, for those of you guys that are skilled and you watch guitar players and you watch uh, artists, I, I love artists and, you know, different paintings and, and sculptures and, and or even athletes, you know, and you see someone who's so good at their craft that everyone else in comparison is just like amateurs. <coughs> so saying, who is that person that fits that? Who is that person? Who is it who condemns? Who is that person that's so much better than everybody? It's Christ. It's Jesus. It's Jesus is him. See, we like to compare ourselves to other people. And I say, well, I, I may not be the world's best artist, but and I'm not as good as my wife, but I might be better than, than so-and-so. Or I might be better than this person. Or, you know, hey, you know, you're building your house or, or, or you know, you're, you're doing any sort of project. You're like, well, I may not be as good as this person, but at least I'm better than that person. And this is part of, this is part of the problem that we have. It's part of the problem that the Romans were having. They kept looking at this comparison. They're like, well, I'm, I may not be, you know, the best person here, but at least I'm, I've done more nice things than this guy. Or at least I've been to church more than this guy. Or, uh, you know, I may, not, I may not go to church every Sunday, but at least I go, you know, more than him. We can't compare ourselves to men because they are not the standard or the judge. See, this God's the one who justifies. We can't compare ourselves to two different churches. To me. Don't compare yourself to me. Don't compare yourself to your neighbor. See, we have to, we have to realize that our comparison doesn't go because I'm not the judge. It's only through Christ. And when we start comparing ourselves to Christ, that's an impossible feat for us to do on our own. Luckily, God says, listen, I have this free gift to give you. This is, this is the grace. I'm the one that renders righteous, but listen, if you ask, I will give it to you freely. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to do everything perfect because I'm going to give it to you if you want it. I'm going to give it to you if you want it. Jesus, who died and rose from the dead, <coughs> says, uh, yeah, Jesus Christ is he. Yes, rather, who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God. This is an interesting uh, thought here. The right hand, that, that, it's an adjective. It's describing a place. It's saying the right hand. It's saying right over here. And we begin to think about that. That, that word for right hand really it means a place of honor or authority and authority. And so, you know, they, they would take and, and uh, King Solomon, uh, you know, he, he brought his mother in to sit at his right hand. And it was kind of like the second in charge. And it was a high place of honor. And we think about as kings and stuff. You know, the, the next in, in, in line or something, or someone would be sit at this place of honor, but sit right next to him with the right hand. I want you to look at the person on your right. That's a place of honor. That's a place of uh, uh, authority. Someone you bring beside you and say, hey, listen, you are right here next to me. Now, if you look at the person on your left, that means uh, uh, they're probably your boss. <laughs> right? That's the king. Which side are we sitting on? <clears throat> and it says Jesus is brought this place right beside the Father. And he's sitting right there at this place of honor. That's the person who, who, who represents and uh, that, that condemns, you know, we're talking about that word condemns, that really represents this life that we have to compare to, that got sent down to earth here for us, that came and lived a life for us. 
to model after. And it says he's sitting right at the, the, the right hand of God. And it says he is interceding for you. He says he also intercedes. Not only is he sitting there, he's interceding for you. Now look at this word, intercedes. It's a verb, and it means to go or meet a person, especially for the purpose of conversation, consultation, or supplication. And so can you see Jesus out there saying, hey, have you considered my servant Job? Have you considered Jose? Have you considered Mike, Bob, Susie? Fill in your name. <laughs> Have you considered my son? Have you considered my daughter? Look at what they're doing. Let's, let's talk about them. And not only saying let's talk about them, look at what Google's def definition says. Google's definition of intercede is to intervene on behalf of another. He's saying, you know what, Jose down there, he does all right. <laughs> He's getting that. He just got his credentials. But you know, he's still got a long ways to go, but you know what, and I know he messes up sometimes, but... But listen, I died for him too. I died for him too. He's, Christ is interceding for you. Christ cares for you. This is what Jesus is doing for you. He's going to the Father on your behalf so that God will justify or render you righteous. The final point for today is Jesus says, I am the way. I am the only way. The only way to Christ, the only way to heaven, the only way to God the Father <coughs> is through Jesus. John 14, 6 says this. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. No one. There is no other way. There is no other way but through Christ. If God is for us, who can be against us? I want us to keep that in mind. Listen, Christ came. God did not withhold his own son. But he gave him over to this sinful, ungodly world. And he gave him over and said, listen, I know what's going to happen. I know you're going to mistreat my son. I know it's going to be ugly. He's going to be mocked. He's going to be... Crucified. We look at, this is the week before Easter, where, when Christ basically gets handed over. And it's almost like that fruit that was ripe, or that was unripe, and then it's going to ripen and blossom. He goes, but I have a plan. And he's going to go through all that. And when you start comparing about being good or being better than other people, listen, you've got to compare yourself to Jesus. And when, when you compare yourself to him, that's not going to be a comparison. And then Jesus is going to, and Jesus, he, he died and he rose again and he went to heaven and he sits now at the right hand of God. He says, listen, I went through, I did all that. If they would only call on me, if they would only ask me to be Lord of their life, listen, I will intercede. I will, I will, I will pray. I will, I will go and have conversation on their behalf and say, Father, I've done it all. This one deserves in. You deserve in. If you've given your life to Christ. I want to I want to ask you a few questions today, and um, let's talk, and number one, I talked about that all things are possible. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Are you still holding back from giving God everything? He's talking about hey God, God gave that which was most precious, and if God would do it, why would He not expect us to do the same? And if if you're still holding back from giving God everything. You say, hey, I, I serve Him on Sundays. That's a great day. But you know what? I still got to do this on, on Monday or Friday or Saturday. I, if you know, and you know, that there's things you have to give to Him. If that's you, I want to pray with you this morning. Number two, are you trying to be good enough? Not by works. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. If you're still trying to compare yourself and thinking, listen, I'm, I'm going to be a good person. God has to let me out. I've been good. I've, I'm, I'm a good person. I do good things. And if you're still trying to earn your salvation through works and through being good enough, I want you to understand that God is the one who justifies. And that's when you say, listen, I need to release that. I need to trust and understand the grace of God, that He is the one who forgives, and it's not me. It's only through Christ. 
It's only through through him. I want to pray with you. <clears throat> and finally, I, I talked about that uh, said that Jesus is the only way. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father by me, but by me. And if you've never asked Jesus to be Lord of your life, and you say, listen, I, I want that. I want God to be the one who goes before me. Uh, and if God is for me, then who can be against me? I want, I want that. I want him to come in and free me from the bondage and the chains and, and all the weight and the heaviness. And, and, and I need a freedom from everything that seems to be going on. If that's you today, I want to pray with you uh, a salvation prayer. So let's pray this morning. Father, we just praise you and we thank you for who you are, God. I pray for those, Lord, that Lord, we're still holding back. Lord, we know you. We've accepted you, Lord, but we're still holding back. Lord, we're only giving you a portion, Father. And I pray that we just release everything. Lord, you who did not spare your own son, but delivered him over for us all. Lord, I pray that we, Lord, that there's just a, a release and a freedom. Lord, you show us what we are still clinging on to and what we think is so precious to us, Lord. I pray for a freedom from that right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. I pray for this struggle, God, that... Lord, we continually try to earn our way. Lord, it says you're the one who justifies. Lord, you're the one who renders righteous. Lord, and I pray that we freely receive that gift of grace, Lord, and understand, Lord, what you've done for us. Lord, and I pray for those that are ready to say yes to you today. And if that's you this morning, you want to say yes to Jesus, I'm just going to say a simple prayer, and you repeat something like this uh, uh, at your home or wherever you're at. And we teach the ABCs of, of, of salvation. Accept, believe, and confess. If you accept Jesus to be Lord of your life, He promises to come in and do it. If you believe in your heart that he, Jesus died on the cross and rose again, that's what Easter is, it says you will be saved. And you confess your mouth. You confess your sins uh, and say, Lord, I know I can't do this anymore. Take it from me and come be Lord of my life. So repeat after me a prayer like Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I am sorry for everything I've done. Lord, come into my life. Lord, be Lord of my life. I believe you died on a cross and rose again. Father, I just commit my life to you. Father, if you are for me, who can be against me? Lord, I pray that you watch over us. Keep us safe. Give us an opportunity to share your love with someone else. And we thank you for everything you're doing. We ask all this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless. Thank you for spending time with me this morning. Have a great week, and I can't wait to see you again. Bye.